And today we have Danielle Frechette, and she is the Marine Resource Scientist for um, Maine Marine Resources, the Bureau of Sea Run Fisheries and Habitat. And we are going to learn all about um, the smelt project that she's been working on for, I think, at least two years now. Is that right? Three, actually, now. Three We years. just completed our third season, yeah. Wonderful. Well, I'll have, I'll let Danielle take it away. She's going to pause um, for questions throughout the program, so you'll have an opportunity for that. Great. Thank you very much, Suzanne. So rainbow smelts are a really cold loving schooling fish. Um, They're actually the first of our sea run fish to return to main streams and rivers every spring because of their love of cold water. They are found in water that can be as cold as minus two degrees Celsius, so below freezing, up to about 20 degrees Celsius or about 70 Fahrenheit. Um, and to be able to not only tolerate or survive these cold temperatures, they thrive because they actually make an antifreeze protein and they also make glycerol in their bodies. And that helps them with their, their ability to swim, helps their muscles work at those really, really cold temperatures which other fish wouldn't be able to tolerate as well. They're a really small fish. Um, they are generally between four and 13 inches long. Here in Maine, they're usually less than 10 inches long. And um, they usually around here live to be about five years old, although they can live to be about eight years old. They are found, there, there are two forms. There's the anadromous form, or what we call the sea run form, and these are ones that move between salt water and fresh water. And so these sea run forms are found historically from Chesapeake Bay all the way up to Labrador, Canada. Um, currently, they're really only found east of Long Island Sound, and I'll talk a little bit more about that later. There is also a freshwater form or a landlocked form that occur naturally in the Northeast US and in Canada. So here in Maine, we do have naturally occurring um, landlocked smelts in some of our lakes. We also have our naturally occurring sea run smelts. The landlocked form has been introduced to many freshwater systems, sometimes for landlocked salmon management. Um, so for example, Lake Champlain has landlocked populations of smelt that we may, may or may not be there naturally. Smelts are really important ecologically. They provide food for things like brook trout, Atlantic cod, Atlantic salmon. They provide food for gray seals, for many bird species like herons. Um, so they're really an integral part of the ecosystem. They also help move nutrients between freshwater and saltwater because of that, that sea runner anadromous life history that spans multiple ecosystems, both fresh and saltwater. Rainbow smelts have had a cultural and economic significance uh, since before the days of European colonization. They're a very important food source for uh, the Passamaquoddy tribe of Maine. Um, again, because they're that first sea run fish of spring, they're the first fish to make it back into the streams, which means they're a fresh source of protein for people as well as, as birds and animals. Um, and the first Record a European recording of smelt was by Captain John Smith in 19, excuse me, 1622, when he stated that smelts were so plentiful that the Native Americans would harvest the fish by simply scooping them up in baskets. And when you see an image of a rainbow smelt run, like the one shown in this image, you really can see how you can scoop them up in baskets or in nets. The earliest recorded uses of smelt by colonists were for livestock feed and for fertilizer. So if you're using something for fertilizer and for feeding your livestock, you can imagine that it had to have been very abundant. And uh, in fact, French settlers harvested as many as 60 barrels annually, where each barrel was 36 gallons per barrel along the Bucktouche uh, River of New Brunswick. So really just a very plentiful resource um, at, be before and at the, the period of colonization. With the advent of railroad and the move movements of those rail lines further down east into Maine, it became possible to transport smelt to faraway markets like Boston and New York. So for example, the smelt trade at the Fulton Fish Market in New York City in the 1870s 
was on the order of 1.3 million pounds annually. And in 1894, the smelt fishery here in Maine supported over a thousand fishermen and had the fourth highest landings only, only behind lobster, clams, and herring, so uh, Atlantic herring. Unfortunately, those early commercial harvests led to very quick declines in smelt populations and actually led to uh, Maine and New Hampshire and Massachusetts creating laws governing smelt harvests as early as the late 1800s. So you can see we're looking at um, this graph shows the commercial harvest of rainbow smelt in Maine and New Hampshire from 1887 to 2007. And you can see that in 1887, there were more than um, more than a million pounds landed. And then as we get into the 2000s, we're, we're you know, really substantial declines. And you can see that they happen pretty early on in the fishery. We do still have rainbow smelt fishing in Maine today. Probably the most popular and well-known fishery for smelt is the winter ice fishery. Um, these are done largely through commercial camps, for example, on the Kennebec River, where commercial operators will put out these ice shacks. They'll put a little stove inside. You can go and they provide you with bait and lines, and you can sit there and dip or fish for smelt with hook and line through the ice. Um, this draw brings a lot of economic revenue into the state still. In spring, there's a handheld dip net fishery that used to operate all along the coast of Maine. Um, unfortunately, the decline in smelt led to the dip net fishery closing in southern Maine. Um, so basically from the New Hampshire border up to approximately Rockland is closed to dip net fishing now. But it is still, that handheld dip net fishery is still a really important source of protein, of, of sustenance for people in Washington County. Uh, where the runs are still strong. There's also a commercial fishery in Washington County in the winter and spring where they use bag nets and gill nets. And then in the fall, there's a limited hook and line fishery in some of our rivers and coastal bays, um, particularly around the Thomaston area. Um, it's fairly popular there still. And the location and timing of those fisheries is really tied to how smelt use habitat, and that's tied to their life cycle. So in winter, when the ice fishery is operating, the smelts are gathering under the ice in sheltered bays and in large tidal rivers. They're gathering and they're feeding and they're putting on, building up their energy stores in anticipation of the spawning season, which happens in spring. So once spring hits, those fish run inshore into streams and rivers and spawn at the head of tide. During summer, the young of year will be present in estuaries and the adults will move out into our coastal waters where they'll stay through the summer. And then in fall, they start moving back towards shores and gather again in those bays and mounts of rivers to overwinter. So rainbow smelt spawning runs themselves. And actually, uh, this is I'm gonna focus most of my talk on the spring spawning runs. And these spawning runs happen at night from mid-March to June. And it's really temperature dependent. So it starts at around 40 degrees Fahrenheit when the water gets to about 40 degrees Fahrenheit and has a peak in activity when the water is around 50 degrees Fahrenheit. And because of this, because it's tied to water temperature, the timing of the smelt run varies along the coastline. So the smelt will start spawning earliest in southern Maine because the water is going to warm up there quite a bit earlier than it will warm up as you get closer to the Canadian border. The smelt spawn Often at high tide, they can use that high tide to get up into the streams, but smelt love the dark. Remember I said they're food for birds and fish and mammals, things like raccoons and otters are really good. They, they're visual predators. They're looking to find their food. So there were some studies conducted where smelt were tagged, and as they returned, it was found that a good chunk of those fish, about 30% of all of the returning smelt, moved at low tide to be on the spawning grounds during darkness. So during some parts of the spawning season, the, the high tide will occur at the darkest part of the night. But when it doesn't, because tide, tide cycles move um, in time as the season progresses, they're really coming in at dark to be able to avoid those visual predators. Smelt tend to mature around age two. Some of the males might mature when they're a year old. 
And we do find older smelt spawning in mid coast and down east Maine than we do find spawning in southern Maine. Males will spawn more than once per season. And if you have more than one male spawning with a female, you get better fertilization success. Females only spawn once per season, and they're what we call broadcast spawners. So they release their eggs out into the water, and the eggs are actually negatively buoyant, which means they sink, and they're sticky. So when they sink, they attach to the rocks at the bottom of the stream. And bigger fish actually lay more eggs. So a bigger fish, an H2, an H2 fish might have around 33,000 eggs. A fish that's a year older will have twice as many eggs. And they lay those eggs in egg mats that can be um, quite large. So what you're looking at in this photo here is a stream. Anything that's green, is greenish brown, is kind of algae and silt on the rocks. You can see some rocks poking out of the water. Everything that you see that's white in here, these are smelt eggs. So this is just a really incredibly dense egg bed in a down east Maine river where the, they're still a very, very strong smelt run. The eggs will hatch after anywhere between a week and three weeks, and it depends on the temperature. So if it's warmer, they'll hatch faster, the, egg, the, 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 the young will develop faster in their eggs and, and hatch faster than if the water's cooler. Those larvae are kind of a transparent little fish that are transported downstream into the tidal zone where they begin to feed on zooplankton. Um, and as you can see, as they kind of grow into a, a more mature um, smelt here. So what makes a good smelt habitat, a good smelt spawning stream? Well, it's one that has a good canopy cover to keep the water cool and to limit the growth of algae, because if you get a lot of algae, it can suffocate the eggs and they die. It'll have an intact riparian area with vegetation that traps sediments and filters pollutants and excess nutrients out of the water column, out of the water before it enters the stream. It'll have a good rock substream bed that's cobbles and small boulders. That's the best for those eggs to attach. It'll also have swift flowing riffles that oxygenate the water and attract the adults. And then it'll, there'll be pools that allow the adults to rest during spawning attempts. And so what you're seeing here is this is a pretty good spawning stream. You can actually see there's a waterfowl here that would be a natural barrier to smelt. They're not great swimmers, so they're, they're, they're not gonna be able to jump that type of a natural waterfall the way something like a salmon might be able to. And then down here in the bottom, um, left corner, you can see the eggs themselves. They're kind of a translucent-y, yellowy, clear color, um, and they're tiny. They're about the size of a pencil tip. Um, so I think this is a good place to pause and take a few questions. Um, hi, Diane. I have a, I'm, I'm Paul, and I have a question regarding uh, the spawning area. Um, it, it's it, the, the rainbow smelt and the blueback herring don't they share the same spawning habitat? I'm thinking of bluebacks and the brackish waters just below, you know, the head of tide. Uh, is that is that true that they do share that? And is there any competition um, between the two? Um, I'm sure the rainbow smelt are much numer more numerous than the bluebacks. And the second question is, is there any competition of rainbow smelt with, uh, you know, the spring fishery for the glass eels, for, for the eel fishery? Very good questions. Um, they do share similar river type habitat for spawning between the bluebacks and, and rainbow smelts. Um, bluebacks are a stronger swimmer and can go further upstream. So you'd find them, you know, in some cases, many miles upstream where a smelter are going to be a little bit closer to the head of tide. Um, they are, they should be spawning in freshwater. They don't always, they're not, you know, they're not always super smart and they might spawn below the head of tide. Um, in which case the eggs will die because of the salt water. So they really, they need to be just above the head of tide, but if they can't get there, that doesn't mean they won't spawn below the head of tide. Um, and in terms of the glass eels or the elver fishery, oh, the other, sorry, back to comp competition between the two. Um, the rainbow smelts are running earlier, generally. So in most places, the rainbow smelt run will be done and actually the eggs will have hatched in the larvae, should be out to sea, are out down into the estuary before before or as the blueback are coming back into their streams. There's maybe a little for a little more overlap further down east, but in general, it's kind of staggered where you get the smelt first, then the AOIs, then the bluebacks. Um, and in terms of the elver fishery, I 
have heard reports of, of elver fishermen catching smelts in their nets. That is one uh, way that we do get reports uh, that the smelts are back. Um, how significant that is, we don't really know. Thank you. Yep. Any other questions before we move on? All right, let's go to the next slide. So I may have alluded to this at the beginning of the talk that rainbow smelts are in trouble. Um, up to even a few decades ago, rainbow smelt were found in this pink area as far south as Chesapeake Bay. Um, however, they're now only found north of Long Island Sound. So the current range is the green area that you see there, basically Long Island Sound and north. The reasons for this, well, there's a few of them. The first is that historical overfishing that we talked about that really depleted smelt populations pretty early on, um, you know, more than 100 years ago. Smelts also need really clean water. Um, they're very susceptible to things like pH changes and pollutants in the water. They are also have suffered substantial habitat loss and degradation, things that uh, channelization of streams and the building of things like culverts that serve as barriers to migration. Um, again, they're not good jumpers. They really need to be able to swim through any potential barrier to get to their, if it's below their spawning grounds, they, they won't make it. In fact, two thirds of the road stream crossings in smelt habitat in Maine have are estimated to be problems for uh, for smelt passage that that two thirds of our road stream crossings in smelt habitat could be barriers to to smelt getting to their their spawning habitat. And then there are also some unknown some threats where we're just really starting to understand the implications um, for for smelt populations. And these are things like what is the impact of climate change? Remember, this is a really cold, water loving fish. As water warms, the habitat that's available to them is likely to shrink. There's also habitat loss that occurs at other life stages. For example, changes to estuaries can impact uh, smelt at other at life stages that are you know, separate from that, that spawning habitat loss. And there's also predation and bycatch happening at sea um, that still remains to be quantified. So, in order to restore and protect smelt populations and try to overcome some of these threats to, to their populations, we really need to be able to monitor their populations. And there are three key ways that the Maine Department of Marine Resources and partners use to help keep tabs on smelt populations. And I'll go into each of, each of these independently. So the first are creel surveys of that winter ice fishery. There are population studies, and then there's a spring spawning survey. So creel surveys are what we call a fishery dependent measure of the strength of a population. And these were started in the late 70s and have continued almost continuously uh, since 2009. And the way these surveys work is that biologists go out to those ice camps and they subsample up to 100 fish per angler. And from those fish, they collect data. They, um, they don't take the fish, they just measure them in, in, at the site. They take the length, the, they identify the sex, um, they take a scale sample to be able to age the fish because scales grow kind of like tree rings and so you can um, infer the age of the fish from that. And they also take a fin clip to look at genetics and figure out what, the, what, what genetic population they're coming from. They also record the number of anglers, how many hours they fish, and the number of lines they used. And that allows them to calculate what's called the catch per unit effort or CPUE, um, which allows us to estimate the numbers of fish that are staging under the ice. Um, and that CPUE is measured as the total number of fish caught per line hour. And when I say fish staging under the ice, that's, that's all the smelt that have come into those, those rivers, those bays that are holding under the ice and, and feeding in preparation for the spawning season. But there are juvenile fish too. It's not just that that population doesn't just include the spawning population. So to understand what's going on on the spawning grounds, we've conducted population studies. Uh, the la these were done from 2008 to 2015. And this is what we call a fishery independent measure of the health of the population because it's not, it doesn't rely on the fishery. 
And this is done using fike nets, which you see in the image here. It's kind of a cone cone shaped net that has wings that go up into the stream and was done at six locations, including in collaboration um, and in proximity to Wells National Estuarine Research Reserve. Uh, these surveys are designed to be representative of the spawning run itself. So we're looking at spawning fish. And the data that gets recorded is the size, the age, and the sex of the fish. Uh, again, a genetic sample gets taken to look at the population structure. Um, they've used these to conduct studies of what, how big the fish are for each age class, um, and also to look at repeat spawning, how often and when fish are um, leaving the system and coming back and spawning multiple times, because smelt, um, smelt don't die when they spawn, they, they're able to spawn multiple times. And we also have a spring spawning survey. This is another fishery independent measure of the population health. And we use this to document spawning in our coastal streams and rivers, and to also collect information on the spawning habitat. So what does the substrate look like? Are there any obstructions like culverts to fish passage? And the measures that we're looking for are the density of those egg mats. So on the bottom, you see kind of those eggs on the rocks, and then also the number of spawning adults. And I'm really going to focus the rest of this talk on the spring spawning surveys because this is this is the, the effort that we've been working on for the last few years. Spring spawning surveys do have a long history. They started in the early 1970s as a DMR effort. And then they were resumed again in 2005 and as an effort between DMR and the DMR marine, DMR biologists and the DMR Marine Patrol. And during these surveys, they uh, during these later years, they surveyed 279 streams. And when compared to the earlier surveys, it was found that only 19% of the streams still supported strong runs. The rest of the streams showed either no smelt or really substantial declines in the, in the number of eggs or uh, spawning adults. Declines were really concentrated in Southern Maine, in Lower Casco Bay, in the Kennebec River, the east side of Frenchman's Bay, while the runs remain strong in northern Casco Bay and the Madomic, uh, St. George's and Penobscot Rivers, as well as around Pleasant Bay and Cobscook. So really kind of more down east is where the runs were still strong. But 279 streams is a lot. And biologists really need help to survey these streams annually um, because it's not only a lot of streams, we have the fourth longest coastline here in the US. Our coastline with all the bays and inlets is actually longer than the coastline of California, which means we have a lot of ground to cover. So trying to get out and survey these streams annually is a really huge effort. And we, the biologists, um, we really just lack the capacity to conduct those surveys annually. We need more, what we need is more boots on the ground uh, helping us find smelt. And so this provides a really uh, great opportunity for community science. And this was recognized um, back in 2015 by the Downey Salmon Federation, which developed, took that DMR survey that was conducted of the, the DMR spawning, smelt spawning survey, and modified it to be user friendly for anyone. Um, and so they led this effort with community, community volunteers to go out and collect data on spawning smelt in Washington and Hancock counties. In 2020, we launched a new joint effort um, among the Nature Conservancy, Downey Salmon Federation, and Maine DMR, um, where we put out a kind of a re refresh protocol, collecting the same basic data as the DMR survey with a few additional tweaks, a few additional pieces of information. And um, in collaboration with the Gulf of Maine Research Institute, launched it on the web as a, a community science survey under their ecosystem investigation network. Um, this, this network is really designed to help us understand how the Gulf of Maine and its watershed are changing, particularly with regards to climate change. Um, there are a wide variety of programs under the ecosystem investigation network and our spawning smelt survey is just one of those. Our survey has both a science goal and a participant goal. So our science goal is to conduct a, a long-term scientifically rigorous coastwide survey to identify smelt spawning presence and absence in Maine. 
And then our participant goal is to connect people to sea run smelts in our tidal streams, the science of monitoring smelt spawning, and to each other as essential partners in habitat stewardship. Whether you're an early bird or a night owl, we have a, a protocol for you. Um, the surveys can either be conducted at night where um, you can don a headlamp and head out to the streams to look for the adults as they're actually spawning. Or you can go out during the day to look for those egg mats. At the stream side, volunteers are also collecting habitat information. So what does the canopy cover look like? Is it wide open? Is it very shaded? Um, how is the adjacent land being used? Is it developed? Is it a is it agricultural land? Is it wetland? Is it forest? Um, and we're also looking for information on any barriers. So that could be a man-made barrier like this culvert, or it could be a natural barrier like a waterfall or a beaver dam. And these survey data will help us protect and restore smelt and their spawning streams. Uh, so what you see in this image is a really great example of how we can, when we know that there's a problem we can fix that can help smelt, how successful it can be if there's still smelt around. So what you're seeing is a stream and, and that kind of rubble in the foreground on the side is, is shoring up the bank because this is a site where Highway 1 once passed through and there was basically a collapsed old Highway 1 bridge um, in the stream bed, in, in the stream that was blocking all smelt passage. So this image was taken, I think, two years, maybe three years after that old bridge was removed and the stream side was shored up. And you can see all of that brown in there, that, those are all smelt eggs. Um, you can see some dead smelts in there because not every smelt survives the spotting run. Um, but just it, it's just absolutely incredible how strong this run is when it was absent uh, for many years because of that, that barrier that the, the old bridge formed. So the data itself will be archived and shared with partners, so the DMR biologists, DSF, TNC, and, bio, and biologists at Wells as well. Uh, the data will be used to help us identify undocumented runs, so streams that might have a smelt population that we didn't know about. Um, it can help us prioritize streams for restoration, for example, trying to um, increase, you know, move, move smelt eggs around to create runs in places where they may have been extirpated. Um, or for a culvert or other barrier replacements. Uh, at this point, the data won't be used for fisheries management changes, but could help us identify where we might want to put more effort to, um, into maybe those populate population type studies that could help us make management changes. So if you're interested in joining our coastwide survey, there are a few steps. Um, the first is to complete a sea run smelt citizen science survey training, and those happen in the spring. Uh, usually for southern Maine, uh, we usually try to do that training within the first week of March so that you can get off the ground with surveys starting in mid-March. And then once you've completed your training, you head out to the stream with a partner, either at night to document the number of adults coming back to your stream or to look for egg mats. Um, and then the data is collected on paper data sheets and its presence and absence. Presence, if, if they're present, you're recording abundance. If they're absent, you're recording absence. And, and I do want to stress that these absences are just as important. In fact, maybe more important than the presences because it, it really helps us identify if smelts are absent because of something that we can go in and try to fix to bring smelt back. Um, we're also, again, recording the habitat data, substrate, the depth, the canopy, adjacent land use, any obstructions to passage. Um, and then once you're back in the comfort of your home, you enter the data into the Ecosystem Investigation Network data entry portal. And that transmits the data to, to myself, um, to the people running the survey, so that we can do a quality check on it and then um, add it to our, our database. And then at the end of the season, we transmit it to the, the biologists who are working on the ground and it helps them again prioritize restoration actions. So when does the survey happen? Uh, it really depends on your geography. In Southern Maine, um, in kind of in the Wells area, we're looking at probably mid-March to finishing up really sometime in April. Um, east of Penobscot Bay, the surveys run from really April to mid-June. 
And the run itself may last only a few nights. And so vis visiting the stream regularly is really important. We generally ask people to go once per week, uh, once, once it gets started. And where? Well, any of the 297 current and historic smelt runs across Maine. Um, if you've got a local stream you know about, uh, we'd love to have you go out and survey it. Uh, we also have you know, a list of, stream of priority streams that have been identified by Wells and by DMR, um, where we'd love to get people to get out and collect data. Um, and some of our high priorities are streams that have historic data, but no current data. Um, so <clears throat> we have a, a lot of options for, for survey locations. And so again, that those trainings will happen at the beginning of March. So if you're interested, uh, please keep an eye out for training dates. I believe that um, Suzanne and Wells will be putting out uh, notices about when those trainings are coming up. So with that, there are a lot of people who've made this uh, possible. Again, this is a really collaborative effort between DMR, DSF, the Nature Conservancy, and the Gulf of Maine Research Institute, um, and all of our other partners. Um, I especially want to thank Jake Amon at Wells, who's helped coordinate surveys and volunteers down in southern Maine. Um, and then I also really want to uh, give a big shout out to Sean Beauregard, who is a University of Maine intern who collected all of the amazing smelt video and um, still uh, still photos that you saw in this presentation. And then, of course, our volunteers. Um, we had, I didn't put a slide about this, but we had in 2021, we had 12 volunteers who conducted somewhere, around, I think it was 150 surveys. And in 2022, two we had 32 volunteers conduct almost 300 surveys so we're hoping to again increase our survey effort and cover more of the state in 2023 so with that i'm happy to take questions we're a small group so go ahead and just unmute yourself if you want to ask a question hi daniel um, this is jake Hey, Jake. Hi, nice to see you. Um, I'm wondering if you could just talk a little bit about the experience that the volunteers had and what sort of challenges they might have faced doing this, because it's not it's not particularly easy. And I know that some folks had smelt streams where they didn't really see much. Um, so you just talk a little bit about that and like why it's still valuable to have people doing it, even if it's not the most exciting um, surveying that they've ever done in their lives. Yeah, so you know, as I said, it, the, the absences are really important to us. We really want to know where smelts still are, but just import, as importantly, we want to know um, where they no longer are. Um, and it, it can be, even for myself, I surveyed two streams this past year, and I, I didn't see anything. Um, but that is, it's really important information to capture because the fish is a species that's really susceptible to climate change. And it helps give us a really, a better understanding of what's going on in the Gulf of Maine, how things are changing as the climate changes. Um, and that that's a really, we really, and, and importantly, as I said, smelt move between streams. They don't have, they don't necessarily have fidelity to one stream. They're not going necessarily going back to where they were born like an Atlantic salmon might. So you can have smelt in one stream and they won't be in the next stream over nearby. But if something changes, if we can, for example, like that smelt stream I showed um, down in Down East Maine where they did the bridge restoration, there was smelt in a nearby stream. That one was blocked. Once they unblocked it, the smelt were able to come up and in. So if you have smelt in one area and you can fix the habitat nearby, you can restart a smelt run. That's another important reason. Um, one of the other challenges is finding the right place to survey. And so we are making a, a bigger effort to get out there and ground truth the location so that we can give start giving, we're starting to build a kind of a database of not just the GPS point, but where people should park how they can get to the stream um, and try to help uh, alleviate some of those challenges as well. Did that answer your question, Jake, or do you have anything that you wanna to add to it with you know, the priorities that you've got? Yeah, no, I think that that really touched on I me. Mean, one of the challenges 
you know, particularly if you're going out in March, is the access. And I think it can be difficult, especially if you're not familiar with smell and smell habitat. If you don't see anything, you start questioning yourself, like, am I in the right spot? Am I doing this correctly? Am I showing up at the right time? And so I think this citizens or you know, community science um, project in particular could be prone to frustration on the part of the volunteers. And it's really asking volunteers a lot to just have faith that even if they're not seeing these fish, that they're still collecting useful information. And I really can't think of another um, or many other types of studies where that might be a possibility. You know, phenology studies, you know where to find the things that you're looking for. Um, the beach profile monitoring program, the beach is there, you're on the beach, it's nice. Um, so I, I think it's, I mean, this is a high, super valuable effort. It's so wonderful to see this happening. And also as a longtime volunteer uh, manager and coordinator, I know that volunteer retention is one of the major challenges for these projects that hope to exist over the long term. And so that's something that I think that those of us that want to continue to see this going forward are going to need to like try to address head on if possible. You're absolutely right. Uh, one of the other things that's important, I've, they are really tied to temperature. And our springs are different every year. Um, we had, was it, it took, was it this year that it warmed up really quick and then it got cold again? Or was it vice versa? I'm, I'm mixing up springs now, but um, we expected to see smelt and then we didn't for another few weeks. So that those repeated surveys are important because it can give us a, an understanding of a better understanding of, of how the spring is, how the spring conditions are influencing when and where they're spawning. Danielle, I have a question um, and I'm going on memory here, but I seem to recall a couple of years ago, maybe more than a couple, three or four, the smell disappeared. <laughs> they just weren't in the rivers. They weren't in even the Kennebec River, as I seem to recall. Um, they just weren't there in any numbers whatsoever. Am I recalling correctly? One. And if I am, do you have any idea what was the cause of that sudden absence um, of, of rainbow smell? I'm actually going to see if Jake has information on that because I only started with smelt and, and came came back came back here to Maine in 2019. So um, my my memories don't go further back than that with this species. So do you do you have any input, Jake? Um, no, I don't. I one thing I can say, Paul, is that it was likely to be and there hasn't been a coordinated data collection effort on rainbow smelt for a while. And I know that Danielle um, is filling a, a biologist role that, that was empty for a number of years. Um, and so it's great to have her at DMR now, somebody who's really dedicated to rainbow smelt. <clears throat> um, so if you, if you did hear that, it was likely that it was probably in one of the major rivers that DMR does keep track of, like the, like the Kennebec River or the Penobscot River. Um, the Kennebec in particular is famous for having smelt shacks and smelt camps mm -hmm. along it that people can go recreational fishing. And um, so it may be that that was a year when people, or maybe a couple of years where people really weren't catching fish all that much. Right. Um, but I, I don't, and I, I kind of remember that too. I don't remember what the reason for that was. I do remember a couple of years ago that it was so warm that there really wasn't a recreational fishing season because there wasn't any ice to put yeah. the shacks out on. And that very much, I think, is going to be the future um, for smelt, for recreational smelt fishing in Maine. Unfortunately, those yeah. camps, I think, are going to start going out of business. Whether or not the smelter there is another question. Yeah. And that's actually something, Danielle, I'm wondering, you did mention climate change a little bit in your talk. Something that I think about a lot when I'm looking at maps of, of habitat, thinking about those areas upstream, um, because smelt are right there by the head of tide, um, is DMR or our other smelt biologists and conservationists thinking about the migration of smelt habitat and those areas that might become smelt habitat in the future and what the implications of that might be, whether they're protected, accessible, high quality? Is that something that anybody is looking at at this point? 
I'm not sure if there's a formal effort. I know it, it's been talked about a little bit. And, and part of the reason we're collecting so much habitat data is that Mike Brown is really interested in understanding what streams <clears throat> may have good habitat and where we may want to focus efforts in the future. So even if there aren't smelt there currently, do they have the right conditions where smelt could persist in the future? where we could focus on on those for um, protection or, or restoration. Um, but in terms of kind of a adapt you know, climate adaptation, I don't know if it's being talked about quite in those terms. Um, I am going to talk with my I have a meeting with Mike later this week and I can pose that question to him. I have a question. Um, you may have said this, but um if you could repeat it then of of all the streams that you're wanting to monitoring monitor how many or what percentage of them are currently being monitored by the volunteers and um how many aren't and then also what are the results so far of all that volunteer effort let's see i think we're at about if i'm remembering correctly about 30% of the streams <clears throat> were monitored this past year. So quite a big jump from the previous year. Um, the, I guess, speaking to the, the challenges that Jake brought up earlier, we didn't have very many surveys that returned positive smelt presence data this year. Um, and I don't really know why. I had some really great volunteers who were very consistent and I think a lot of these populations may simply be remnant populations that are, are really either absent now or really hard to detect visually. <clears throat> so one of the things we are looking into doing um, in the 23, 20, piloting in the 2023 survey is adding an environmental DNA component, which would be having a subset of streams where water samples are being collected as well and then sent to the University of Maine for processing to use eDNA techniques to identify um, smelt DNA. Um, so is there, is there smelt DNA present in the stream, in the sample, which tells us that there are smelt presents, but may, maybe at a, a level that's just too low for us to, to visually observe. Danielle, just to follow up on that, um, the 30% of streams that are being monitored, are they spread out across the state or are they primarily in one part of the state? They were pretty well spread out this year. I think, did we have three streams being monitored in kind of the Wells area this year? A few around Casco Bay. Um, we had a, we've got a, a good volunteer base around uh, the Bristol and the Bristol Peninsula. And then uh, some good, we've got a few folks around Thomaston. And then most of the effort, a lot of the efforts coming from down east, we have a big gap basically from the, the kind of the Penobscot Bay area. So we're, we're trying to in, really find a way to increase effort around Penobscot Bay. Um, that one's been a challenge. I have a question. Yeah. Um, so I work with Dr. Nathan Fury at the University of New Hampshire. I'm actually his master's student studying smelt. Um, and I've noticed with the past couple of years, there's a neat trend in New Hampshire where the runs kind of start out um, with the larger individuals, including more of the females. And then as they get towards the end of the run, it's smaller individuals and a lot less females. Is it a similar pattern up in Maine as well, or is it a little bit more consistent throughout the run? I actually don't know because we haven't been collecting biological data. The last time that um that's the same types of surveys, the fight net surveys that New mm -hmm. Hampshire's still conducting. The last time those were conducted in Maine was, I think, 2014. Mm -hmm. So, um, Jake, do you remember anything from those earlier efforts or from the data you collected around wells? Um, I would have to dig into the report. I don't remember off the top of my head, um, Chloe, but there's uh, Claire Enterline's study. Yep. Um, and then we have a report on our website. Um, which, which chronicled a number of different species for spring diadmus fish runs. Um, so, if you have any, if you're interested to seek that out mm -hmm. and you can't find it online, just uh, let me know and I can point you towards it. Sounds great. Thank you. 
Any other questions? All right. Oh, uh, sorry, Danielle. Oh, I do have yeah. I do have one more question. <clears throat> sure. Uh, you mentioned returning smelt to to streams that no longer have them. Could you talk a little bit about like what is involved with doing that? What are the techniques and what's the success rate that um, that folks have seen doing that? I know that Massachusetts has done that a little bit, where they've had they've actually taken eggs and put them in streams there to try to restart runs. Um, is that happening elsewhere? Is that happening in Maine anywhere? It's not happening in Maine currently. Um, the efforts I know are, are the ones in Massachusetts, and um, it's something that Mike Brown has talked about trying, but as far as I know, it hasn't, it's not something we've done yet. Um, and what would be the, what would be the impetus for doing that? That would actually be a, a better question for Mike. Um, so my kind of my role is, is helping collect these, these community, conduct help lead these community science surveys to help figure out where where our presence and absences are and then hand it over to Mike as the kind of the state smelt biologist to make make the decisions. Um, so I don't he's talked about it. I don't know exactly what his impetus or what the the reasoning or the the um, triggers might be for that. Um, perhaps I'm, if yeah. I'm, I'm thinking that you know as volunteers spend time in these streams and the you know, the profile of rainbow smelt is being raised by this program that you may get communities that become interested in, in restarting these smelt runs. And so it may be that, you know, like the town of Wells wanted to petition DMR um, to institute a, a smelt restoration project in one of the streams. Um, so anyway, okay, that's good to know that yeah. it's not happening, but it, it could happen. Yeah, and I guess one reason I could see for it to happen be if we had, a, if there was a, um, you know, a, a big restoration effort on a stream where there was some barrier that was uh, changed, that maybe you know, kind of seeding the habitat to to try to jumpstart a run there might be one one possibility. Um, and I guess I I didn't say this during the talk. One thing I really do want to say about the survey is that. This happens at the kind of the mud seat the mud season, right? So it's the end of winter. The snow is not good for cross country skiing or downhill skiing or snowshoeing. The kind of the winter sports are over, but we haven't really gotten into the spring. The kind of the real you know, can't really take your mountain bike out yet because the trails are wet. You can't, and there's a lot. It's that kind of transition season when you may just feel like you just want to get outside. It's a great way to give have a reason to go outside, and and it's something that I've really love doing and like as I said I, I've got two streams that are near me that I monitor and it's just a really great way to get up from my desk in the middle of the day to go out and look for smelts and to, to really observe the change of the season so I had I've had a lot of fun with it even though I didn't see smelt or eggs um, just giving myself an excuse to get outside and away from the away from the computer in a time when I might otherwise be stir crazy because my snow is gone and it's not warm enough to go to the beach yet. And maybe a great opportunity for um, students at schools, if you can get some teachers on board, if there's a stream close to their school. We've actually had that. There's a teacher in um, the St. George's area who there's a stream nearby and she had, did get her students out and actually did a podcast. Um, I'll see if I can find the link and, and send it, but it they did a really neat podcast about the stream and um, going out and doing the, the smelt surveys. Thank you so much, Danielle. You're welcome. Thank you all for having me. And I, I hope to maybe see a few faces uh, at next spring's training. <laughs>